Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's good to see each of you this afternoon. And uh, I have the honor to introduce you to our guest this afternoon, Dr. Joel Green. For those of you who haven't been able to be at some of the earlier sessions, um, let me just give you a brief synopsis of Professor Green's background. He comes to us from Fuller, where he's been since 2007. They're serving as the Dean of the School of Theology, Associate Dean for the Center for Advanced Theological Studies, and Professor of New Testament Interpretation. Prior to moving to Fuller, he served for 10 years at Asbury Theological Seminary as Professor of New Testament Interpretation, Dean of the School of Theology, and as Provost. Professor Green has written or edited more than 40 books, um, including six that have won awards, plus scores of essays and reviews. He's also the editor of several commentaries and journals, um, and so comes to us with all of that vast experience and scholarship as part of his presentation to us. This is the third gathering in the 2016 Earl Robinson Memorial Lectures. The overall theme is the call to be human, God's people reflecting God's image. Last evening, we were introduced to the influence of neuroscience on our understanding of soul and what it means to be human. This morning in chapel, we were challenged to consider how we as individuals and as the broader church provide for and respond to those who are not of us, those who are not like us. And so this afternoon, Professor Green's presentation is titled Healing, Health, and Reading Scripture. There will be opportunity for questions following the presentation. And now I would ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Green. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I turned on the television this morning and uh, was reminded of the difference between Winnipeg and Southern California. We don't have the Weather Channel. <laughs> Every day it would be sunny, warm, sunny, warm. Here, I guess you need the Weather Channel. Uh, what will the wind chill factor be? How many degrees below zero? It's, a, it's another world, isn't it? I've been praying for you since I got here. <laughs> Lovely to be with you again and to uh, have some time together to look at this important topic. And thanks so much for that introduction. I want to begin by asking the question that I began raising last evening, namely, uh, what does it mean to be human? Now, this question has far-reaching implications for the life of the church, for our understanding and commitment to what it means to flourish as human beings, to the goals that we set for ourselves on life's journey. <clears throat> in fact, back in the second century, a profoundly biblical theologian named Irenaeus wrote that God's glory is found here in a human being fully alive. The question is, what would that mean, fully alive? By way of introduction to this question, I want to make two claims. First, that we in the West, many of us at least, are desperately out of step with Scripture when it comes to understanding what it means to be human. And second, that reflection on healing and health in Scripture can help to reorient us to the question. First then, we are in the West, many of us, desperately out of step with Scripture when it comes to understanding what it means to be human. Let me draw your attention to what I think is a profound work by the Canadian philosopher uh, Charles Taylor in his book, Sources of the Self. Tracing uh, the apparatus, the resources for the way human beings have come to understand themselves in the West, Taylor lands on a number of important, almost slogans, you could say, bumper stickers, for how we put ourselves together as humans. Human dignity, he says, for us lies in self-sufficiency and self-determination. Identity is grasped, above all, in self-referential terms, I am who I am, 
or in the words of that famous most modern of men, Popeye, the sailor man, I am what I am, and I ain't what I ain't. Persons, Taylor argues, have an inner self with the authentic self associated with the inner and not the outer self. And then he goes on to say that basic to authentic personhood for many in the West would be self-autonomy and self-legislation. I hope you have read there the number of times the word self gets used. Now, if you look at the witness of Scripture, this is nothing, of course, but a brief summary. You begin to see a quite different set of understandings. <clears throat> there we are. Uh, scripture, with its understanding of the construction of the self as nested in social relationships, and therefore the importance of relational interdependence for human life and identity, a premium on the health and integrity of the human community. I'm reminded of two of those slogans, uh, one of which you are certainly aware of, uh, coming from Descartes, I think, therefore I am, versus the Libyan um, slogan, we are, therefore I am. Quite a different way of putting the world together, those two. Scripture with its assumption that a person simply is one's behavior, that is, one's deepest commitments are unavoidably exhibited in one's practices, so that attention focuses on embodied life, this allowing the possibility that the real self might be somehow hidden or relegated to a person's interior. And then finally, the call to live out the human vocation as this is drawn from a vision of Yahweh's own character, God's, if you will, God's difference, God's holiness, his otherness in relationship to the cosmos. First then, the degree to which we're out of step with the witness of Scripture when it comes to what it means to be human. Secondly, another claim, reflecting on he he uh, health and healing, for some reason I'm having difficulties here, yeah, reflecting on health, uh, healing and health can help to reorient us to what it means to be human, reorient us around the question of what it means to flourish as human beings. In fact, healing is central to the story of Scripture I can make four key observations in this respect. First, Scripture as a whole presumes the intertwining of salvation and healing. Second, Scripture as a whole interprets the image of Yahweh the Savior as Yahweh the healer. Uh, one example in Exodus chapter 15, I am the Lord, the one who heals you. That's what Yahweh says just after the liberation of God's people from Egypt. The New Testament adds to this the portrait of Jesus as God's agent of healing. In the larger Roman world of Jesus' day, salvation itself was understood in terms of healing. So doctors, if they were to use business cards, might simply put on, the, on those cards, Dr. So-and-so, Savior. So tightly was Savior, salvation, and healing uh, intertwined. And then fourthly, God's people are called to be a community of healing and health. Those four summary statements regarding salvation and healing in Scripture. Now, by way of getting us more deeply into this different way of seeing things, I want to direct our attention to a short account we find in Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. I hope you won't look this up in your Bible if you have it handy, because I want you to read it very slowly with me. Luke 7, 11 to 17. <clears throat> Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. Give me two or three observations about the beginning of this story. It's a real question. It happens after something else. Exactly. In this case, it's the story of Jesus and the centurion uh, and the centurion's slaves healing. So soon after something, this happens. What else?
Yes, there is on the one hand Jesus, and on the other hand, there's his disciples and a large crowd with him. And so if you were the person standing behind the camera focusing the lens, your focus might be especially on Jesus, and then the disciples and those around him might be a little fuzzy in the background, but they would be present. Yes? What else? Yeah, there must be some purpose to this journeying, we might think. Jesus, uh, you might say, is a walkabout uh, prophet or a walkabout uh, theologian of a sort. And so he's walking from one place to the next, in this case, to Nain. Let's go a little bit further into the story. <clears throat> As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. Three or four more observations. I know, everything just seems obvious. But part of reading scripture is trying to make plain what seems obvious to you. There's both movement in and movement out. Tell me now, who's going in? Verse, two, uh, verse 12. Jesus, what happened to the disciples and the crowd? They seem to have blurred even further into the background, so the focus is even more narrowly on Jesus. Tell me what else is going on here. Right. The, he's being carried out. We don't know exactly who or how, but we assume that there's more going on. So there's a narrow focus on two characters, Jesus and the dead man. Yes? So if you were teaching this on Saturday night or preaching this on Sunday morning, what would the title of your sermon be so far? What did you say? The unexpected. Jesus and the dead man. Others? Life and death, yes. There is this uh, uh, rabbinic uh, saying, rabbinic proverb, that when you read in the Old Testament, they would just say simply scripture, when you read in scripture that so-and-so is barren, then you know what will happen next. There will be a child. Now, similarly, if you read in the New Testament Gospels that Jesus is encountering someone who's dead, what's the next thing that's going to happen? You expect a resurrection. And so if you were thinking ahead, you might uh, title your sermon, Dead Man Walking. Maybe not. <laughs> Unexpectedly. It reminds me of uh, uh, reading years and years ago the story of Smith Wigglesworth. You know this, this uh, apostle of faith, do you? No? Smith Wigglesworth, uh, early associated with the army back in Britain, who walked into a, a, a hospital room. The person he was going to see had just died. And he felt the quickening of the Holy Spirit to wake him up. And so he did. And it's the most amazing story I've ever read uh, until, of course, I read this one. And we'll see where this one takes us next. <clears throat> he was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. Now what do you see? I'm sorry? A second, a second crowd. We started with one coming in, and they sort of disappeared into the background. Now another one is coming. What else? I'm sorry? Grieving. Grieving people, yes. What else? I'm sorry? His mother. Tell me about his mother. She's lost her loved ones, yes. Yes. Tell me more. 
Yes, the, the mother has lost her source of support. What else? You wonder why the crowd is with her. What are they doing, that crowd? Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Tell me more. Only son. Only son, right. So not just lost her son, but her only son. Tell me more. <laughs> it's going to be a crowded gate. Uh, this, of course, is a, um, a traditional town with a gate. So you expect certain things to happen at the gate, buying and selling, uh, judicial operations, and so on. Uh, in this case, we have a woman. And what do we know about her? What are her problems? <clears throat> her first problem is she's a woman in a man's world. Her second problem is she's a widow. Her third problem is she's lost her only son. So she's a woman in a man's world without a man. So she is, in that sense, marginal. Where is the focus of this story now? It was on Jesus and the dead man. Now the focus is where? I'm sorry? On the woman. In fact, it's even interesting the way that Luke tells the story. When I was uh, uh, younger than I am, and my daughter was younger than she was, she always used to be upset when she would go with me on trips or uh, to places where uh, people would know her as Joel's daughter. This is Dr. Green, and this is Dr. Green's daughter. She didn't like that very much. Uh, and so she enjoys now when we are introduced to each other because often she's more well-known than I am. And so this is Allison and her father, her unnamed, no-name father. Uh, so people are being introduced in relationship to who's important in the context, right? Tell me how this man is introduced. in relationship to his mother, yes? And not the other way around. Somehow the woman has become the focus of the story so that if you were thinking the story is about a dead man and Jesus, you might have to recalculate as you read through this text ever so slowly. There we are. When the Lord, are you with me? When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, don't weep. Interestingly, in Luke chapter 6, which of course comes right before Luke chapter 7, in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, blessed are you, happy are you who weep. Yes? You will have joy. Don't weep. Then he came forward and touched the, how do you say that word? Do you say beer? <clears throat> In West Texas, we couldn't say beer. <laughs> so we had to say buyer. Beer is something Christians didn't participate in. Touched the bier, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Tell me, what's the focus of this story? What is this story about? On the one hand, it looks like a friendly neighborhood, everyday raising of a dead man. On the other hand, strangely, the focus is actually on the woman. Not, if you will, dead man walking, but dead woman walking. The restoration of life, you might say, to this woman. Are you with me so far? Reading texts like these poses a series of hard questions. Whose medicine, 
Whose notions of health? Whose notions of healing? What does it mean for a person to be a human fully alive? Why is it that commentary after commentary after commentary focuses on a dead man and overlooks a dying woman, a marginal woman, a woman whose days are numbered, if you will? We gain some perspective from medical anthropology or from ethnomedicine. Robert Hahn, a medical anthropologist with the Centers for Disease Control, proposes what has become a widely used typology for reflecting on healing and health. <clears throat> he talks on the one hand about what he calls disease accounts. In disease accounts, he says, the body of the patient is the source of the disease. The disease is located within the body, under the skin, below the mind, at or beneath the skin, below the mind, and therefore, the intervention needed is likewise below the mind, under the skin. You go to a doctor, you complain about an ailment, the doctor says, take some medicine, come and see me in three days. Actually, I've never heard a doctor say such things, but that's what we used to say about doctors. It's all about the body. You have a problem with that part of your body, let's replace it. Let's put in a new one. Let's get one to substitute. And then Robert Hahn talks about illness accounts. Illness accounts consider people as embodied people, but also embedded within their social environments. And that the source of sickness can be all of that or related to all of that, and therefore the place of intervention, therapeutic intervention, would also be taking into account social world as well as bodily life. Does that make sense? Let me give an illustration of this. When I was the dean at Asbury Seminary, I had a phone call from one of my faculty colleagues down in Orlando, and she was telling me she was about to miss two weeks of class. I immediately went into pastoral mode and began to try to comfort my colleague. And she said to me, finally, when she figured out what I was doing, she said, Joel, it's not really so bad. I just need to go be with my mother, who is ill. I immediately went into deanly mode. Two weeks of class. You're missing two weeks of class for something that's not serious. She finally recognized what I was doing. And she said, Joel, you don't understand. In Puerto Rico, she says, when someone goes into the hospital, the family moves in with them in order to take care of them. I immediately thought to myself, that's not what happens in Kentucky or California. In fact, usually what happens is, as soon as you enter the hospital, you're separated from your family. You keep the kids and the dogs away. You don't want them bothering the patient because after all, the problem is biomedical, biological. Puerto Rico seems to think that the issue here could also somehow be related to family. Relationships are part of the healing process. Family nestedness, part of the process of healing. Illness accounts. Thirdly, Robert Hahn talks about what he calls disease accounts. These are accounts that consider people as embodied human beings within their social environments, but also within the universe at large where there can be the source of sickness. For them, the world is out of balance. The cosmos has to be put back together again. Now let me ask you a question. In the West, what kind of account do we usually think of when we think of disease or illness or sickness? Disease accounts, illness accounts, or disorder accounts? It's a real question. In the West, we usually think of sickness in terms of disease accounts. The body of the patient is the source of sickness, and therefore, the locus of intervention, therapeutic intervention, is typically the body. In a text like the one we've just read from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 7, verses 11, 17, what are we talking about? Disease accounts, illness accounts, disorder accounts. <clears throat> A 
I've heard two answers that don't agree with each other. Are there others? Shall we take a vote? How many of you think this is a disease account, Luke 7, 11 to 17? How many of you think it's an illness account? How many of you think it's a disorder account? How many of you aren't right sure what we're talking about? <laughs> exactly. Well, you could make an argument that this is clearly an illness account. You could also talk about it in terms of a disorder account, which is, in fact, what Luke often tells, disorder accounts. The point is how easy it is for us to read uh, 20th, 21st century assumptions about health and healing back into these texts without taking seriously, or if you will, without reading slowly enough to see the ways in which the text itself is pushing against our notions of health and healing. In this case, Luke 7, 11 through 17, in this case, a story that's very much concerned about the restoration of a widow who's lost her only son. Now, let's be clear about this. I'm not trying to suggest to you that it's not kind of an interesting and unexpected thing that Jesus raises someone from the dead. For good reason, that attracts our attention, and we say things like, wow, or awesome. But what's most interesting about this story is, in fact, the degree to which it focuses on the consequences for this woman whom Jesus seems to have compassion on, and uh, the whole miracle story is told in such a way that brings restoration. Recall the words that I quoted last evening from that Vietnamese-American astrophysicist, Trinh Xuan Huang, when he said, to this day, the brain and mind are regarded as two distinct entities in Western medicine. When we have a headache, we consult a neurologist. When we are depressed, we are told to see a psychiatrist. Given that way of structuring reality, why would we not unreflectively segregate healing, which is biomedical, from salvation, which is spiritual? In fact, however, when it comes to the voice of Scripture, the voices of Scripture on healing, there's no room for segregating the human person into discrete constitutive parts whether bodily or spiritual or communal or social or so on. Consider again, for example, the text from this morning, Luke 13, 10 to 17. This is the story, the case of the bent over woman, a person whose dual problems are spelled out, first of all, in the fact that she's a woman in a man's world, and secondly, because she's diseased and has been for 18 long years. Her social status, her place in the community, symbolized in her walk, in her gait, in her incapacity to stand up straight, so that she walks around as if someone who is unnoticed, not really a human being. Almost, you might think, like people who live in wheelchairs that go so often unnoticed because they aren't quite at eye level. The sort of problem that you would have in the first century where mothers say to their children, don't stare at her. She is, after all, contagious. Not in the sense that we might get her germs, but in the sense that we might be known by our associations with her. The problem that this text addresses is this one. Who's at fault? Who made this woman a sick woman, a marginal woman, the way Jesus responds to her might lead us to suggest that the problem is the devil, uh, Satan at work in her life. But in fact, in Luke's wider perspective, evil is always against God's agenda so that all forms of salvation are in some sense a pressing back against the work of evil in the world. At fault actually in the story is a synagogue that has excluded her from their own community. A synagogue uh, to whom she's come to be involved in prayer and teaching, to engage with Yahweh, the God of Israel. And yet this is the synagogue that has held her at arm's length and wonders, in fact, about her healing on the Sabbath. What is her account? Is it a disease account? An illness account? 
or a disorder account. At the end of the day, I think we'd have to say, her world has been put back together. She's been healed, but in the healing process, she's been made, again, a member of the community. Her world put back together. One of these days, I'd like to ask Luke, what happened on the next day? What happened in this little community the next day? How did the community of God's people respond? But in this case, what's interesting is that Jesus responds by talking about the importance of healing or loosing on Sabbath. That actually working on the Sabbath to bring healing to this woman was a way of remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy. We know that Sabbath instruction is grounded both in Exodus and in creation. And so that we understand that this woman's participation today in this world, in this time, on this Sabbath, is a participation in the rest that will characterize the world to come and in the loosing of bondage that characterizes Exodus and New Exodus. Let me look at another story with you. So here's the story, Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. This is a well-known story, the story of uh, Jesus and his disciples crossing over the Sea of Galilee and coming to another place where they encounter a man who is demon-possessed. Consider the possibility of this man coming to your clinic and you having to write down his symptoms. How would you describe his symptomology? The patient presents with what? Well, apparently he's homeless. He's from the town, but he doesn't stay there. He's out here in the graveyard. He's homeless, living in a graveyard. He's unclothed, he's naked, which from a Jewish perspective would actually suggest something like not quite human. He has superhuman strength, he is, in fact, you might call him a wild man. Taken together, these qualities are a kind of barometer of his social distance, his religious exclusion, his being demonized, his world out of whack. Moreover, if we were the ones engaged in triage with this person, we might call for a psychiatric consult. After all, this guy seems to have a problem with identity. Is he an I or is he a we? Is he a one or is he a many? He has a difficult time apparently moving from first person singular I to third person plural they. And as you read the story, consider the end result of Jesus' therapeutic intervention. What does healing and health look like? And so we begin with the story the man from the city was possessed by demons. He had lived among the tombs, naked and homeless. When he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down before him. He shouted, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. He said this because Jesus had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had taken possession of him, so he would be bound up with leg irons and chains and placed under guard but he would break his restraints and the demon would force him into the wilderness. And now look at the end of the story. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully dressed, completely sane. They were filled with awe. Those people who had actually seen what had happened told them how the demon-possessed man had been delivered. Then everyone gathered from the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave the area because they were overcome with fear. So we got into the boat and returned across the lake. The man from whom the demons had gone begged to come along with Jesus as one of his disciples. Jesus sent him away saying, return home, tell the story of what God has done for you. So he went throughout the city proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. We've discussed symptomology, but notice the degree to which the end result matches point for point 
the problems that the man had presented at the beginning of the story. Healing and health, well, he's no longer demonized. And it's as if he has a new name. Verses 35, 36, and 38, repeatedly, this is the man from whom the demons had gone. That's now his name, the man from whom the demons had gone. He's now sitting at Jesus' feet, not a wild man. He's sitting in a position of submission, of learning, of discipleship. He had been naked, and now he's fully clothed. I don't know where he got his clothes. I don't know if Peter had a backpack and said, here, take an extra set. But now he's fully clothed. And he was out of his mind. Now he's in his right mind. And listen to this. He wants to follow Jesus as his disciple, but Jesus, notice, restores him to his community, sends him home with a job to do, with a vocation. He's sent back to his community, restored to his community with a vocation. What kind of story is this, if not a disorder account? An account that actually presses beyond what seems obvious about his being demonized and begins to look more carefully at the ways in which from social, from psychological, from communal, from spiritual, from physical, what other words you want to talk about, here is a man who has been restored. At the end of the day, what I'd like to suggest to you is that he doesn't have a spiritual problem, he has a human problem, multifaceted human problems that Jesus addresses in his interface with him. And now let me suggest a corroborating voice. This one from the letter of James tucked there toward the end of the New Testament. James 5, 13 through 16. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, call the elders of the church, and the elders shall pray for them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. A few reflections. First, notice in this text how restoration of health is concerned with physical wellness, to be sure, but not in a way that can be segregated from life more fully. Social, forgiveness, other issues at work in this same text. In fact, the interweaving of healing and forgiveness speaks to a vision of personhood that is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy integrated. Likewise, Life before God is worked out within a web of relationships with the, within the Christian community, characterized by peace, care, and forgiveness. And in fact, it seems to me that you could say that James presents ill health among people within the church as a kind of test of the church. Our first instincts might be, and often are, to quarantine the sick. Typically, those who are not well, the weak, the hurting, the lonely, the diseased, they become the targets of progressive isolation, usually through implicit acts or through simple neglect. But if we don't isolate the sick by deliberately locating them in room by themselves, but rather by adopting behaviors that keep them at arm's length, does that make the segregation any less powerful? But here's the question. Will the community, and particularly the leadership of the community, answer the summons of the sick and gather around them with faith and prayer? Or will the sick find themselves progressively excluded from a community that is fearful of its own survival? Reflecting God's character, the God who is rich in mercy, rich in compassion, reflecting that kind of God, the community of healing prays and confesses sins together, confident in God's goodness. Finally, some lingering questions. 
what kind of portrait of the human person? What view of the human person is at work when we think of healing primarily or only in biomedical terms? When we struggle with why God heals this person but not that person, how much is our struggle over prayer and healing and faith actually a consequence of narrow thinking about the meaning of human restoration? If salvation entails human restoration, then what sense does it make to prioritize one aspect of human life over some other aspect of human life? What would happen if we move away from language about physical problems, emotional problems, spiritual problems, and the like, and instead begin to talk about human thriving, about human flourishing, or about what it means to find God's glory in human beings fully alive? Thank you for your attention this afternoon. Let me see what questions you might want to pose. <clears throat> if you don't ask questions, then we'll all go outside. <laughs> <clears throat> Save us. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, just wanting to pick up on uh, a bit of your focus on human identity. Uh, one of the issues we face in Canada at the moment has to do with the way historically our indigenous peoples have been treated. And uh, a phrase that has often come up is the need to heal identities socially. How might that connect with the kinds of things you are saying here about healing? Well, thank you for that question. Um, it's always nice, of course, to have from someone from the U.S. come and give you advice about Canadian problems. <laughs> uh, the, the issue, of course, is First Nations uh, issues in Canada uh, uh, are in some ways like uh, issues related to Native Americans in the U.S., and so there, there are some analogy to what we're talking about. What's fascinating about the language you're using, of course, is they use, you're using the language of healing or you could say restoration, um, which suggests in my mind that there's actually a, a closer connection between uh, Aboriginal people in Australia or the Maori people in New Zealand or the Native American in the US or the First Nations person in Canada, closer connection uh, with them to the people of the New Testament era uh, than maybe people like myself coming from the West who have to through a leap of the imagination, think of people in different ways. Um, if First Nations people are concerned, especially, for example, about the land, about landed identity, uh, about a community existence that goes beyond the kind of interdependence even that I might talk about, then healing has to involve something far more radical, you know the word radical, down to the roots, far more radical than uh, uh, an apology, uh, far more radical than we shouldn't have done it that way. Uh, how do you overcome, for example, uh, you know this story better than me, this, the, the way the school systems operated with First Nations people, how do you overcome the, the scars and the pain from all of those years? That, of course, is an area where I won't even venture uh, to begin speaking since I want to listen to my First Nations uh, brothers and sisters about what they would regard as restoration or healing. But I think that the issue you raise is exactly the point. Uh, if you think only in biomedical terms, uh, then you have a truncated understanding of human identity and human health. And uh, strong bones and teeth, uh, uh, good muscles will not bring health uh, to First Nations people. Um, one of the things it seems to me that you're talking about is a 
what I would call a holistic understanding. And one of the things that I get from holism, and uh, I don't know if you've read The Ghost in the Machine, um, he talks about to understand wholes, it is essential to understand them as parts. And he developed a new term called holon uh, to describe that fundamental relationship that parts are wholes of something else, and yet they're parts of something larger. So that when you look at when you look at uh, <clears throat> the widow you see she is part of a larger reality. And you also see her son as part of her reality. And you see the two of them as part of the town of Nain and part of a larger reality there. And when Jesus comes, the whole town is part of a larger reality, which is the people of God. So that we tend, I think, uh, to think of parts in materialistic terms. In other words, it's like a bag of marbles, and you can throw some out. Whereas in a holistic sense, a part is essential to, being, to, to becoming whole, and finding that relationship between the part and the whole is, I think, essential to, to understanding modern biology and the steps that are, that are the, the radical transformation that's happening there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, let me just push back a little bit, not too much, because I want to agree with a lot of what you said. What worries me uh, with, with uh, thinking about parts and whole is that we tend to use a, what I might call an engineering metaphor or, or scheme for understanding parts and wholes so that I can look at this, you call this a podium? Yeah, and, and I can find all the parts and I can nail this part here. I can add on this part here. I can drill a hole here, which you can't see, uh, but apparently someone thought a microphone should go here. And I can uh, put on wheels. So it's, it's adding things on that may not be necessary to the hole. A lot of what we see in scripture actually doesn't follow engineering uh, metaphor schemes. Uh, the metaphor scheme is more organic uh, so that uh, gifts of the Spirit grow, um, character uh, comes out of. So there's, there's a, a more intimate connection between parts and wholes than there might be in an engineering metaphor. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Uh, and I, I want to push against the engineering way of thinking when it comes to the holism I'm talking about and push in the direction of organic agricultural uh, uh, parts that actually uh, grow out of and not simply can be attached to or screwed down to or bolted on the whole. What other questions? Do you Another have? way to say that is uh, I really can't be a whole person uh, if, if I'm not organically related to a community. Um, I, I have to somehow um, be landed in a space and time. And I would say, I'm a part of the community. Yep. Yep. Someone in the very back. Apologies. I, I, I had to come in late. So um, I, I just caught sort of the last part, but. Uh, I answered your question in the first 10 minutes. <laughs> Exactly. It, it's to pick up on this last bit. I, I, I think you plant the interesting idea that um, healing, I, I might think of it as sort of an instant, a moment, um, where you're suggesting that uh, we need to think of these things in terms of their narrative, if you want. And, and so, yes, you're asking, so what was it like the next day in that synagogue? It seems to me to be a, an integral part to what you're saying. Yeah that healing is not a moment, but healing is part of a continuous process? Is that, is that? 
No, I think you're quite right about that. And I also think it's true to say uh, that in the case of the woman bent over, for example, uh, what makes her life difficult is actually the community surrounding her. Uh, it's not what you might call a life-threatening disease. It is uh, a problem, and, uh, but it's especially a problem uh, socially, and you might even say religiously, on a socio-religious uh, form of uh, continuum. Uh, the same you might say about leprosy in the New Testament, which is uh, unlikely to be what we today in the modern world would call leprosy, Hansen's disease, uh, but is a skin rash, which is actually far more problematic on a socio-religious continuum than it is on a biomedical continuum. Uh, so there are various ways in which these things are community-based. Uh, they grow out of the history of God's people. They grow out of a history of who to include, who to exclude. And so the question becomes in my mind, when we think about restoration or the restoration of all things, uh, the issue has to be a, a different kind of community that relates to people who are disabled among, in our midst. Anyone else? Oh. Oh, there's, uh, he's got the mic and then he'll pass it to you, okay? Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, could you say something about how this particular story of the, the widow at, at Nain, mm -hmm. uh, how would you relate this to the notion of Christ's own death and resurrection? How would I relate it to? To, to Christ's own death and resurrection happening later in the story. Um, how would like, I relate like this, this, this is a This is a soteria salvation story. Yep. How does it connect with that? Well, uh, I'm not sure where you want me to go with this, but I'll take a stab and then you can say that wasn't it, uh, if you like. But I think it's an important part of Luke's story, the way Luke tells the story, especially Luke 24, Acts chapter 1, that um, uh, the Emmaus story, uh, the story of the Emmaus where Jesus encounters the two disciples, um, the story just after that, the appearance of Jesus to the disciples, the story of the, uh, the, the 40 days after Jesus' resurrection before his ascension, these are all stories that in some ways... Um, um, uh, designate that Jesus is really Jesus. Uh, he actually says in Luke 24, I am really he, in part by the way he relates to his disciples, the reestablishment of community. Uh, he eats with them. He's with them for 40 days. He teaches and he eats with them. Do you have anything to eat? They hand him a fish. He eats uh, in Luke 24 and in Acts chapter 1. But also the degree to which Jesus uh, invites them to understand his identity in relationship to the identity uh, in Scripture, that is, to his own story in relationship to the story that has been being written about God in Israel uh, all those many years. So it's a narrative identity. It's a communal identity. It's a, it's a, it's a physical, not physical, spiritual, not spiritual. It's, it's a different bodily uh, identity that carries him over into the new life post-resurrection. And so, in that sense, there's a lot of comparison you might make between those two stories uh, around the issue of restoration, narrative identity, um, re-establishment of community, those kinds of things. Is that what you were after? Yeah, helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's an interesting story because Luke 24 goes to some degree, to some lengths, to try to say that Jesus is not like he was but he's still the same Jesus. So he can pass through walls, but he eats. He's unrecognizable, uh, but I am really he. Uh, so there's, there's something not quite the same, but there's also something quite bodily about Jesus post-resurrection. And I think Luke is working pretty hard at that point as he tells the story to, to comment uh, against certain kinds of Greek ways of thinking uh, in favor of some other Greek ways of thinking that talk about continuity and discontinuity from this life to the next. Yes? 
I'm wondering if you would be willing to share some of your thoughts on um, suffering and being human and the response of the church to that. Yeah. Um, um, in what, five minutes? I, um, I, things are just rolling off of my, through my brain right now, trying to sort out what to say. Uh, let me tell you a story. I was uh, recently appointed as a professor in Northern California in the area of Berkeley, where you may be surprised to hear there are some Christians. And I was teaching a course uh, for the college I worked for in Berkeley uh, down in another city called Mountain View. And a woman uh, who participated in classes in the college was going to drive with me down for this class that evening because she had missed a class session. She had just lost her husband. And um, in the midst of our conversation, I said, so tell me, uh, where do you go to church? And she told me a church I had never heard of. And I said, oh, I'm so surprised because practically everyone goes to First Presbyterian Church Berkeley, uh, this shining example of an evangelical congregation. And here's what she said. Oh, I could never go there. Everybody there is too happy. And I said, ha, 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 ha. you must be joking because Surely there's no church where everybody's happy all the time. And she said, actually, uh, when I was last there, I was urged to stop mourning the loss of my husband. His name was Whale. To stop mourning for Whale, to stop my crying and get on with life. And I thought about the degree to which that is so representative of the church that I have known in the United States, where suffering is what you put in the bottom left-hand drawer of the desk, the one with the lock on it, and you lock it up and you, you keep it there because somehow that's not part of life. That's not part of being a Christian. Christians are, as uh, my doctoral supervisor used to say in jest, happy, clappy Christians. One of the problems in that respect is the way in which we often think about suffering as God doing something uh, to, to balance the scales so that when someone is suffering, uh, they might ask themselves the question and often do ask themselves the question, what did I do to deserve this? Or when is the other shoe going to fall? And so reading through First Peter, uh, reading through the Gospel of Mark, reading through the book of Acts, you see repeatedly that, that people suffer in part often simply because of following a Jesus who got himself executed. That there's no necessary one-to-one -one relationship between uh, doing something wrong and God getting you because of what you did. I hope that you don't experience things like this in Canada. My, uh, my uh, wife, who would probably not want me to tell her story in a camera uh, just now, <laughs> nevertheless was raised in North Texas where... Um, the way you became a Christian was you get the hell scared out of you. And it, had, it was a difficult time for her to come to the understanding that good, bad, or whatever, God loves you, just God loves you, just God loves you, uh, just God loves you, God the compassionate one loves you. I think that's one of the problems that we have in, uh, in the Christian church in the United States. Again, I hope this isn't Canada. If you take seriously the direction, though, that these kinds of stories take us, then it seems to me that they ought to press for a, a, an ecclesial, a, a, a churchly community um, that doesn't go out of its way to suffer, <laughs> but does go out of its way to identify with those who are suffering and to be the community of God's people embracing uh, people in pain. And in that way, sharing the pain, and in some ways, even perhaps in some cases, uh, lessening the pain by the sharing of it. Uh, often when I think about these kinds of things, though, I have to admit I run into a little bit of despair because I keep looking for the place, the church, where stuff like that happens, where people actually engage with each other in just that way. 
There are communities, of course, large community, for example. Uh, there are communities where um, uh, suffering is embraced, where uh, people actually take upon themselves the ministry of being with uh, the bereaved or with being with the dying. And those are the people whose faith, it seems to me, often go all the way down. Uh, and the people who don't struggle with the problems I was talking about earlier, about wondering about the one-to-one -one autobiographical relationship between things done wrong and suffering. <clears throat> I don't know where you want me to go with all of this, but those are some, uh, uh, some unorganized responses. So oh, that's loud. Okay, um, I'm I'm kind of curious whether uh, you have sort of anything to say about what this would imply in terms of a politics. And uh, um, I'm just curious because I think often um, when we've talked about monism or dualism, you mentioned you went back to the 17th century in your previous lecture, and some of the sort of famous dualists, say for example, uh, someone like I, I guess. Hobbes is often talked about as, say, a materialist who is talking about, you know, the mechanistic relationships in society and there being a sovereign who kind of represents the sort of transcendent God on earth. And in opposition to that, there were a lot of monists who tended to be Republican in, in the sense that not Republican in, <laughs> in contemporary Republican terms, but Republican in a much more radical kind of uh, um, uh, communitarian understanding of civic duty and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm just curious whether um, when, you're, when you're imagining human beings uh, in these terms, whether that carries with it an implicit politics. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm sure that I should be able to say a lot of things about your question. Um, but let me just say two things, if I might. One is, if you take seriously uh, the Christian story, then you could never uh, end up where Hobbes has ended up, could you? Uh, insofar as the sovereign actually becomes uh, flesh. And uh, I really like this phrase that one theologian put it, the incarnation was not a 30-year experiment, or depending on how you date things, 33-year experiment. Uh, the issue, of course, is that when Jesus uh, ascends to heaven uh, in Acts 1, 9 through 11, it's not some part of Jesus that ascends. Jesus takes up into the Godhead uh, humanity. The incarnation, if you will, continues. And so the idea that, that there's this uh, wide uh, gulf between sovereignty and material would be problematic on incarnational grounds. Uh, parentheses. I really wish we took that more seriously. Because if we did, we'd have to take much more seriously uh, the significance of the cosmos in which we live, the world in which we live, and the way the Orthodox Church actually does far better than the Protestant Church end of parentheses. Uh, so that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is, is uh, actually what I said last evening, which is um, what has happened, it seems to me, as a consequence of a pervasive dualism, some might even say a pervasive little g Gnosticism in the United States, uh, there's, there's a, a distinction drawn between uh, my spiritual life, which belongs to Sunday morning, or if you're an early riser, four o'clock in the morning for your first two hours of prayer. But then you can say, now I've got my spiritual life out of the way and I can get on about my business, as though these were quite separate things. Our constitution in the US uh, is used repeatedly to support just that thing, the separation of church and state, which means that uh, I can be a churchy person one day of the week and then I can be don't know what to say. Non-churchy person. The rest. Practical. Practical. Hmm, yeah. Uh, Stephen Carter's book, The Culture of Disbelief, is useful in this respect when he talks about how everybody wants you to be a faithful person as long as you're in your own home. Uh, but before you walk out of the door to go to work, you hang up the coat, the cloak of your spirituality, and you go out into the public where... Uh, religiosity, spirituality has no particular role. Uh, so the debate going on right now uh, in the U.S., uh, Republicans, Democrats, or whatever those words even mean anymore in the U.S., 
uh, is in part the question, does, uh, does, well, does, can the Pope speak to politics? Uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly outrageous question from the perspective that I'm laying out because it suggests that all of life is, is in a sense, then seamless. Um, of course the Pope can speak about politics because everything is politics and everything is religious. And you keep going down the road with the denial of the isms that separate one part of life from another. Uh, if you have a monist perspective, there are a lot of issues that simply cannot occur to you. The debate that happens in many churches that I've been involved in could never happen uh, if we shared a monist view. Namely, shall we attend to someone's spiritual needs or to their physical needs? Shall we run a pantry for homeless people or shall we evangelize? Those simply aren't the options available to people who have a monist perspective. Uh, there's no such thing as, uh, well, I'll put it another way, they're simply human issues, all of which are ways of serving God's kingdom. So it's not a question of uh, uh, this or that. It's a question of, of what do, do these human beings require uh, in order to experience restoration. That's a political statement, yes? Yep. Interestingly, though, even uh, I, I read in uh, city newspapers uh, that kind of distinction. Shall we support the arts or shall we support the homeless? And they put that in terms of soul, art, uh, body, uh, homeless. What an interesting dichotomy. Where did they get that? And why hasn't the church been pushing back against that kind of dichotomy? That's what I want to know. Anyone else? All right. Well, I want to thank each of you for being here this afternoon and for the discussion and the dialogue that we've had in response to Joel's presentation. I invite you all to come back at 7 o'clock this evening. Bring a friend. You know what uh, the opportunity is. And uh, please join me in just saying thank you to Joel this afternoon.